Hey there, everybody. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of In the Prog Seat. Tuesday night, we're talking Prague. And tonight is actually a uh, going to be a cool show. It's kind of like a part two to last night's Hudson Valley Square show. So if you saw that, the theme was, and again, this is an idea that's part Eric Porter's idea, part Chris Allo's idea. One guy from each show, we kind of put them together and bloop, out it comes. Uh, on the bandwagon, off the bandwagon. So basically, these are bands that at some point in time throughout our lives, we really liked a lot. We listened to them quite a bit, whether it's one album, multiple albums, we really dug them and then something happened and we just stopped listening to them. This is not Jump the Shark. So it's not something this band did that upset us, that stopped us listening to them. So it's not a bad album, a series of bad albums, a stylistic change, a change in lineup, whatever. We just moved away from them and for no apparent reason. And maybe somewhere down the line, we got back into this band again, maybe or maybe not, or maybe we just never did. Uh, but may, and maybe we still even really like the stuff that we used to dig, but we just never explored the catalog any further. So I've asked uh, everybody to pick out three examples that kind of fall into this thing we're doing here. And uh, let's introduce everybody here on the panel today. We've got, uh, I'm going to start at the top today. So we've got to my right and left, Eric Porter, George Lemay, Chuck Alvarez. Our center square tonight is Chad Hutchinson. Lewis Nasser, Stephen Reed, all the way from Scott, and we're keeping him up late once again tonight. We're slave drivers here on Sea Tranquility, <laughs> and from Canada, Mr. Rick Labonte with the so, Northern Lights. Uh, guys. Howdy, gentlemen. Good to see you. Greetings. Good evening. Good evening. Hey. Tuesday nights are always fun here on Sea Tranquility, right? Big time. Always fun. So uh, we're going to start. Uh, we're going to go in the exact same order that I just kind of called there. So we're going to go. We're going to go, Eric. Myself, George, Chuck, Chad, Lewis, Stephen, Rick, and then round and round and round we go till we finish up uh, with our three picks. So, uh, Eric, kickstart us on this on the bandwagon, off the bandwagon, since it was your idea. Only right on. You get first. Right. Good, Good evening, John, John. Eric. How's everybody doing? All right. Let's see. We'll see. I'm start. Um, Pete, this is going to include you. Um, this is a band that I got into. Uh, I played in a band in the 80s and early 90s that did some prog and didn't really know much about this band. And somebody had suggested to us that we play a song called Outward Bound. Never had heard it. Um, I'd heard the band before. Uh, really liked the song. So I went out and bought a couple CDs and the band is Wishbone Ash. And I bought Argus, Front Page News and New England. And I can't tell you why. Um, but that's where I stopped. And about a year and a half ago or two years ago, just before COVID, a buddy of mine called me and said, uh, hey, Wishbone Ash is playing the egg. Great. Let's go see him. Um, got delayed about a year and a half. And then Pete, I let him know and he ended up getting a ticket. And we went to that show together and it just completely reignited my interest in this band. I'd always liked them. Um, but I think at that time, when I was playing in that band, I started getting into progressive rock, um, probably wasn't making a ton of money just out of college. And, you know, you bought a couple things and I was learning a lot about prog bands. So you, I started buying a lot of other stuff. You only have so much money, you only have so much time. So that's really the only thing I can think of is I had a couple good albums. I liked them. Um, but I was kind of building my collection at that point and just... I had those three, I guess I was satisfied, but there was definitely a, a pretty good period of time where I just never pulled those out again. And then uh, thanks to Pete, I just got about three more live CDs from them. Great show that we saw about a month, month and a half ago. And um, you know, to me, that was the perfect example because there was no reason that I stopped listening, listening to them. And then seeing them live really reignited that, like I gotta get some more stuff. So. Uh, Wishbone Ash is my first choice. Great choice. And I wonder, maybe when we're all done with this exercise today in, in a, you know, an hour or so, how many of the bands that we pick have such a huge daunting catalog that I wonder if maybe subconsciously that also could be one of the reasons why we never went any further. 
case in point with my first choice here today. Uh, I When I first started listening to these guys, and I don't remember exactly when it was, probably in the mid, late 80s or early 90s, uh, most people who I talked to about Tangerine Dream were like, oh, the early albums are so good. They're so good. And I was like, all right, cool. So I just started snatching up and buying like a whole bunch of their 70s albums. And I bought like everything they did in the 70s and uh, up until Force Majeure. And I really liked it a lot. And all the other albums just, again, it's a little bit different than the stuff that I normally listen to. It's really not prog. It's more kind of like this electronic ambient spooky mm -hmm. shit i don't know whatever you want to call the early tangerine dream stuff and i really loved it a lot all the albums and then i never bought another one never ever bought another one and i will say i probably especially like over the last like 10 15 20 years i really haven't listened to any of them all that much <laughs> but occasionally i do pull them out and be like oh yeah then i realize what i really liked so much about them but then you know i'm thinking well it'd be kind of cool maybe to get some more and then i look at that discography and i'm like oh where the hell do you go there right <laughs> after this <laughs> you know and, and some people you talk to i think i had this conversation with ken golden ken if you're watching you did tell me that you know some of the stuff or a good chunk of the stuff after this is not quite of the same quality i don't know because i haven't really heard i just know that all these 70s albums are really really good i'm sure there's plenty of good stuff that came after it i just never bothered to get any more and again like i posed to eric before is it because the rest of the catalog is so immense and I'm just too scared to take a dive in or, you know, it's where do you start? Which ones do you pick? I don't know. If anybody has any ideas, let me know. Uh, I've always wanted to go ex explore more of their stuff, but I just never did. I never went back to it. Uh, I think with a lot of those 70s bands, uh, so a trans tan yeah, Tangerine Dream is one I think of. Camel, I can think of is, is another one. You, they have a strong 70s output. Yeah, and then you, you start to hear from other word. people that like, they, they get to 1980 or 81, it starts to get different. It's a little watered down. And it, it, that in, in conjunction with the big catalog, you're like, well, maybe I have enough of their stuff and maybe I really don't need to hear that. Yeah. That's what I think. I think, I think, I think we, we think that the best work is behind them. I got the very best. Like, uh, yeah. I wouldn't want to see them you know, go down to the point where I don't, I'm disappointed. So you take them on a high note or whatever you think. But I think that's a big part of it, especially the 70s band. Yeah. You know, if they would have released like maybe three or four more albums after this and then that was it, I'm sure I would have them by now. But there are like, what, another 30? I don't, I don't even <laughs> want to guess. It's probably a ton. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. But yeah, Tangerine Dream is my first pick of today. Nice. Over to George. My first one, uh, I was on uh, 1999, I was on a FTP, if people remember those, like the private file sharing thing. And the rule on this one was only three songs per band. So you're not like a, you know, album stealer. So I listened to three songs from this band called Evergrey, Solitude, Dominance, Tragedy. Really interesting, like heavy, but like a gothy edge, mm -hmm. proggy, super emotional vocals. So I went after... Loving the three songs, I go out and get it. The next album is even better than that. Master Plan is my favorite album from them. Then they put this one out, Recreation Day. I mean, they're just on a roll. They're in my top five at that point. Then Inner Circle comes out, and I bought it. For whatever reason, I kind of shelved it. I was just, it, it didn't hit me first time, I guess. I just ended up putting it to the side. And after that, it was like falling off a cliff. I never even check them out to even know if they went downhill. I just think a big part of this is uh, your friend set. If your friends are like, dude, why don't you have this? Then maybe, you, you know, you, you dig more into it. But if you don't got anybody prodding you, sometimes I think that's a big part of it. And I didn't, I guess they fell off for other people because I wasn't getting prodded. Mm -hmm. I shoot forward 15 years. And uh, all I'm hearing from bands like that now are the first video singles. So I came back in for the Atlantic. I liked the first two singles from this. I like this album, but again, the last album, I did check into it and uh, I didn't dislike it, but I'm willing to let them go again. It didn't grab me like the other stuff. It's very, a very strange thing, but that's my first one in Evergrey. Yeah, that's a good choice. A really good band. Right? If you were talking to me 10 years ago, I would have been proud of you because I, I, I think all, with the exception of like uh, Monday Morning Apocalypse, I think all their albums are really, really strong. Mm -hmm. and just 
very consistent. You know, maybe they come out with an album too often because they're like, they're another band, like almost every year you got something new from them. It's like, you just getting over the first one and then here's another one, you know, here you go. <laughs> and, and they're long albums. They're not short ones. So yeah, that's a good choice. They're kind of like variations on a theme. Sometimes they're a little samey and yep. you feel like I have these five. I don't need five more of those, you know? Yeah. True. True. Cool. All right. We're off to a good start here today. Chuck. What's All up? Right. Good evening, gentlemen. Um, what's that? Mine is a band that I discovered um, via Progressive Ears. You know, what's that? Um, it's a band that when I first heard them, I was floored. You know, it was like listening to Yes. Um, what's a, at the begin at the peak of their height, and you know, with, mixed in with a little Genesis and King Crimson. Um, the group that I'm talking about is the Flower Kings. You know, the Flower Kings, I remember what's a listening to them and I was just floored by them. I just thought that everything that they were coming out with was just awesome. First album I purchased from them was Star, um, Stardust We Are. And I played that album to the point where I literally wore the grooves off the CDs, if that could ever happen. <laughs> then, I, then I got Space Revolver uh, like a few years later and so, and it just, it just didn't click with me. And so it just seemed like it was too long. And um, I haven't listened to them ever since. Not, not even, not even a prodding. Not even like, oh man, if I could just pick this group out and so and just put it on and so. I haven't listened to them, and I really haven't cared to listen to them either. You know, I just think that they're just a, a little bit too prolific for my taste. Because just as you mentioned before, you know, you come out with an album like every five seconds, and I'm like, listen, you just came out with an album like two hours ago, and you know, you're coming out for another album, and and I just lost my interest in them after that. You know, still an amazing band, but I haven't listened to them in like a good 15, 20 years now, if that's it the case. It doesn't help that everything they put out is a double album either. Yes. Mm -hmm. A lot yes. of music to take. Uh, yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. A lot to take in. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. So that's my number one. Mm -hmm. Cool choice. Cool choice. Chad. Okay. Well, my first pick uh, is a band that I first heard of uh, <laughs> back in around 1996. And at that point in time, I was working uh, a bit with Chris Busby's band, Phineas Gage, after he had left um, Echolin. So it was, it was he, he and his brother and uh, Scott McGill, Chris Ike, Laura Martin. Um, and they would do a lot of shows in Baltimore. Um, they would play at Orion. Um, Luis, what was the other bar down there a lot of bands played in? You on mute? On mute. Um, I don't know. It, it depends. Maybe they were playing um, that punk place uh, in, in, in Fells Point. A lot of, no, a lot it wasn't of Fells Point. <clears throat> Definitely wasn't Fells, Fells Point. Point. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, uh, there was another place down there they played a few times. And uh, Phineas Gage played several times with this band. Uh, and the band is Bodian. You remember? Oh, yeah. Wow. Sean, yeah. Sean Persinger, great guitar player. Um, <clears throat> saw them so i saw them their cds from their table uh they're signed to, they are they're signed to cuneiform uh the first one's not the second one astronomy astronomy made easy which is really cool yeah. um cut out cover and then they they only put out three albums and the third one is the, uh, the stolen bicycle um Perfect. all three of them are good um at that time that kind of fusion might get it but I did like it. I wasn't sure if I totally grasped, grasped it. And I think that's kind of why I fell away from it. I wasn't completely getting it. Like I wanted to like it, but then other things got in the way. You know, I was listening to other things. And um, I guess about a year ago, I have out of my deck, you know, I, I grill a lot. I have speakers out there and I'm always just running like a, a random mix of progressive rock music while I'm out there kicking a ball for the dog and having a beverage or whatever. And uh, a song came on, a really cool fusion kind of thing. And I was like, what the hell is that? And I went over to my phone and I checked it and I was like, oh, that's Bodean. God, I haven't thought about those guys in a long time. So I went back and I pulled out all three of the albums, listened to all three of them, and he melted my brain. They're, they're, these albums are intense. Sean yeah. Person, he's a, he's a nut of a guitar player and a nice guy. I'm actually friends with him on Facebook. Um, but if you don't know these guys, George, I don't know if they're on your radar at all. Okay. Yeah. Um, really great band, and I, um, I was glad glad to get back into them because I didn't understand them before. And this time around, I felt like I got it, and I really appreciate it. It was nice to get that 
little teaser outside on the speakers and, uh, and be reminded of a pretty great band with a, with a limited run of uh, really three really nice albums. I wish they would have released more. You know, they are pretty damn good. I enjoyed them. Yeah. So Chad, when you heard it, it didn't click with you. You, had, you went back and looked to see who it was on your phone. Yes, yes. So it came on outside and I was like, yeah, you know what, that's pretty cool. And then I brought up my phone and looked at the playlist. I'm like, holy crap, I haven't heard these guys in 20 years. <laughs> so like that same week, I went back and I listened to Astronomy Made Easy. No, actually, you know what? I went backwards. I started with the Soul, Stolen Bicycle because mm -hmm. there was a song from that that came on. And then I went backwards. And I think the second and third, Astronomy Made Easy and the Stolen Bicycle are very, very strong. Um, the first one's good. It's probably a, uh, a degree under it, if, if, in my opinion. But really, three, three great sort of um, fusion albums with a little bit of avant going on, a little, little, little tweak to, on the on the little tweak. Let's put it that way. So there's some good stuff on pressing here. Yeah, you know, twenty years later, because you got older and wiser, and you can appreciate it a little more, right? Hey, if I can get myself into Vandergraaff generator, I can get myself into just. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Come on, check. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> I think I think because I have all three of those as well. I haven't listened to them in like fifteen years. Easy. I should pull those. Recommend it. Yeah. Go back. I to remember it. totally digging them when they first came out, and I just, you know, you got a million things to listen to, right? Yeah, so, exactly. Falls by the right. wayside. Yeah. yeah, give them a shot. Go back and give them a shot. That was uh, that was a, a really nice rediscovery. Another you know, another band too, right around the same time. Remember Ozone Quartet? Yeah, exactly. I was about mm -hmm. to mention them. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. another good one that I haven't listened to in a million years. Wow. And, and, and Boudian were even better live than on the album. Yeah. I think that was part of my issue, Luis, because they were, they were so intense live. And then I get the albums. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is cool. But I don't remember it. Yeah. It didn't grab me as much. And I think eventually I just kind of like put them in the shelf. Mm -hmm. And then, like I yeah. said, last year it came on. I'm like, you know what? This shit's smoking. Yeah. It's Great cool. stuff. I Yeah. I'm happy to hear that. And a big shout out to Sean and the guys. 100%. He's a good friend. Yeah. Lewis, what do you got? All right. So the first one, first band that I, I was really into. And, um, and then for reasons that I don't really understand, they suddenly just dropped out of my listening habit. Will have to be in honor of Stephen, um, the, the great Fesh. And, and, and Fish, um, when he quit Marillion and he released The Vigil in the Wilderness of Mirrors, I was all in. I thought that was a great record. I, I loved Internal Exile. It was not as good as Vigil, but it was pretty good, mm -hmm. you know. And I was with him all, all the way without hesitation until uh, he released Fellini Days. I got that record. I don't dislike it. I think it's a pretty good record, right? I was, I, I also, whenever he did tour the States, that's back when I lived out in the East Coast, I would go to all the shows. And, um, and then there was that near fest where he was, he was one of the performers and, and, and me and, 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 and Fish exchanged words at the bar. But that's not the reason why I stopped listening. It was just, um, I just stopped realizing he was releasing albums. So I actually missed out completely on um field of crows 13th star and a feast of consequences i didn't even know they existed right now if you try to buy them you have to sell a kidney right it's 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 very <laughs> difficult to get a hold of them so i am i i, I am not yet at the i mean no disrespect to fish but i i, I value my kidneys more mm. so i'm not getting those however um i it just happened that during the pandemic, he released Weltschmerz. And I pre-ordered, I ordered directly from him. <laughs> and it is such a painfully beautiful record. I absolutely love it. And um, I now I'm really, I, I went back through YouTube and I listened to all the ones I missed. And at Nearfest, he played, I, I think, from 13th Star. He was, the, I think that was the album that was at the time. That's but right. I, yeah. I didn't even visit his merch table. This is how, how, how far off the grid I was. I, I didn't hear he had new records. I assumed there were none. 
and I just drifted aimlessly and didn't didn't bother. And um, and uh, I, I I wish I I'm gonna have to find a way to get a hold of those records sometime because they're, they're actually quite good. There's a but DVD I, but that, I just, on your fest show. Yeah, yeah, I could have, but you know, could have, should have, would have, didn't happen. If, if um, you pre-ordered Welsh Melts from his website, yeah. I'd imagine you can get, and admittedly, they are the deluxe editions, and they're not the cheapest things out there. Precisely. So, I, mean, I may that. have no choice at this point. I just have to, this is this is a stupidity fee, right? <laughs> And that's that's fair. That's fine. But <laughs> well, you know, Lewis, the truth of the matter was is they were not promoting those anywhere because I even myself, I didn't buy those when they first came out because I had no idea some of these albums came out. Yeah, I was the same so way well as you. Profile. No clue, right? Yeah, I, I I thought that that fish being at Nearfest was like all these things these these guys always did. They would bring out the dead, right? <laughs> I fucked them up so that you would be like, holy shit, they're there. It's amazing. Right? <laughs> and um, and um, I, that's what I thought, really. I, 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 I suddenly just stopped. I think the last tour I saw Fish do was Sunsets and Empire. Wow. That's a long time ago. Yeah. yeah I, think that, I think that's the last one and until the Nearfest performance. So this is why I just thought, well, I don't know what this guy's doing. Maybe he's just called it a day. I don't know. But um, I'm glad that, well, now he's effect effectively apparently calling it a day. We'll see. Right? <laughs> never say never. But um, yeah, my first choice will have to be Fish. Cool. Can I, uh, can I tell you a quick story about Fish and Nearfest? I, I, yeah, I, I, please. A good one. A good one. Uh, he and his manager rolled in. They got a ride from somebody. And so they rolled in mid, mid to late morning and uh, they were playing. It's Friday night. So he rolls in and, you know, he's had a beverage or two the night before. So you can tell he's a little, he's, he's moving a little slow. <clears throat> so he finds the coffee room downstairs. He comes back up and he's sitting on a normal sized person's chair out on the loading dock. So, you know, how tall he is, his knees are that's above that's his hips. He's sitting there like that, right? Like, like an adult garden class, you know, on one of those chairs. So he's sitting there kind of with his head down with a little cup of coffee. And I walk up to him. I said hi to him earlier, and I walk up to him, and I said, um, "So, fish, I've got, I, I got a little surprise for you." So he looks up with this, this glare, like, "What?" And I said, "I've been in contact with Mark Wilkinson, and we have a slide for every one of the songs in your set tonight with Mark's artwork." And he just looks at me, straightens his head, and he goes, "Fucking brilliant." <laughs> that's it that was it <laughs> mark wilkinson is a super nice guy i love that guy yes. to death yes, great yes. guy great guy. excellent artist man that's oh, a yeah. story and yeah, a great just story. happy that you did all the work for that right yeah yeah fucking yeah. brilliant yeah. <laughs> all right steven what do you got well I've got a slightly left field take here because we're fortunate enough, or some, some of us here are fortunate enough to write for the Sea of Tranquility webzine. And in many ways, it kind of changes how you experience some new releases because we're fortunate enough to be on these kind of digital downloads or streaming emails that come through and you get a chance to listen to albums that you either maybe wouldn't or you maybe would. It's a curse in certain ways because you find lots of things that you think, oh, never knew that was out. I didn't know anything about that. And then sometimes you hear things and you think, well, that's really good. And then it just seems to slip away. And for me, the band that it seems to do that with all the time is this one. It's Transatlantic. So I bought this debut when it came out in 2000 and around there. Same. This was ginormous this was just blowing everybody away wasn't it this was the biggest prog news in the world anywhere and no wonder with the people involved and it's a phenomenal album and arguably this one's even better and i mean i'm not mucking about i've got special editions and multi-disc sets and various things i'm a fan i'm in you know now admittedly they went quiet after that and i think there's something like eight years until album number three comes out and I just didn't get on board. I don't know why. I mean, I'm fans 
a massive fan of two of the guys in the band, and the other two guys are hugely popular, hugely talented, and what they do in Transatlantic, to me personally, trumps anything that they do outside of that. And if I have, and this is, there's a slight cheat here, because I've actually heard just about everything in this catalogue. Because when we saw Marillion, and obviously Pete Travis is in both bands, one of my friends, as we left, bought the whirlwind at the merch desk. And we listened to it in the car on the way home, with me going, yeah, I kind of fell out with this band and I haven't listened to them in years, and listened to it on the way home and thought, that's really good. I haven't bought it. Don't know why. I just haven't bought it. And then writing for SOT, I've heard Kaleidoscope. Really like it. Didn't buy it. Don't know why. I've heard Kaleidoscope. Really like it. Didn't buy it. I don't know why. And then there's the Absolute Universe. I've heard both versions, not the ultimate Blu-ray, massive everything, but I've heard two of the three versions. One's okay. One's really, really good. And yet again, I haven't bought it. And I don't know why. So I've heard all of these things. So it doesn't really qualify. But at the same time, they may be really qualified because I like all of these albums a lot. <laughs> and yeah, I still haven't gone out and bought any of them. <laughs> and I don't know I why. Will, will I fix that? Probably not. And I, don't, I still don't really know why because, I mean, you can go read the reviews. They're getting four out of five, four and a half out of five. I'm telling people why they're absolutely brilliant and they should go and buy them. I stand by that. <sighs> And yet, obviously, I don't because I haven't bought them myself. But if I hear them, I think, oh, they're great. And then I seem to instantly forget about them straight away. And I can't quite tell you why. So Stephen, that, that's just, my first point. Stephen, at this point, we should check on Rick and see if he's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Rick. Behind him, behind him, behind him. Breathe in, breathe out. <laughs> it's all from UK. I can't wait. To... <laughs> Steven, well, I think that... a great example because I can't tell you why I haven't bought them because I genuinely think that everything they put out there is really, really good. They're and amazing. I just have, I mean, I have got myself in a routine with the kind of things that you get through to review like that. For the end of the year or the start of the next year, I think, right, I've kind of done an album ranking for the site. I need to go through at least the top 20 and make sure I've got a physical copy of all of those. And they, they are in the top 20 of those years, and I still haven't done it. I, 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 there you go. So I don't know why. <laughs> but do you World's think they have kind team. of a sameness to them where hmm. maybe you got the first one, you bought the second one, they're both great? Can't be but that. There's not a lot Eric. of difference between the it two. Can't be that. There, there's an interesting thing as well, because I would agree with that, Eric. I really, I really would. But there's an interesting thing as well with some really good music that, I've got, and I don't know if anyone else does the same thing, where there's albums you really like, but they're never the album that you reach for. It's never the thing you think, oh, I know what I'm going to go and listen to today. There's, you know, there's albums you go back to, there's bands you go back to, there's things that sometimes you think, you know what, I'm going to go and listen to things I've not heard in the last five years that are sitting in my own collection, because where's the point having them if I don't? Mm -hmm. And there are certain bands that just never quite bubble to the surface of that. I actually can't tell you the last time I listened to either of these, but it is years ago. But there's nothing wrong with either album. I'm not telling anyone I don't like this band. And that, that's the thing. This is not a negative topic. I mean, as everyone said, oh, is Rick okay? Of course he is. But I, I really like these. They're both really good. Will I, will I listen to them tomorrow? P tomorrow? Probably not. <laughs> Same. Right. That's right. Same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good choice. I am having a, a, a debate with myself every two hours as to whether or not I should go see them. And, and then the, and the main argument I have against it, even though everything you said is true, is they're playing in St. Charles. That's fucking far away. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, if, 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 if that Charles was anything to do with our Charles, I would go. This is a different Charles. <laughs> this ain't Charles, Illinois. You know, and that that Charles, that's not my kind of Charles. How far is it from you guys? Oh, it's at least an hour, and it's it, it's it's you know, rural Illinois. Hey. My you uncle, know, my uncle lives in St. Charles. He hates it. Uh, it's uh, a shit show for me. <laughs> no disrespect, 
but but <laughs> for me, I'm a city rat. Mm. I'm out there and I'm confused. There's like a fractal. Everything looks the same as everything else. A copy of a copy of a Xerox of a Xerox, and I'm just not happy. So I and it's a long ass drive, yeah. and it is it's, it's and and and, and then I have to see Mike jump and play, and and, and and this makes me happy. But at the same time, then I have to think halfway along the show I'm going to be thinking, oh, I'm going to drive back. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I just get on the train, right? Lewis, now you know what I go through every time I want to go to a concert. Yeah, I, I, I've been to hundreds of shows in my life, and I would suggest that maybe three of them would be less than an hour's drive. <laughs> no, I, I, know, I, I, I realize that I'm speaking like a petulant, spoiled American. I get it. <laughs> However, <laughs> it, it, it still doesn't change the fact that that's how I feel. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and at some point, you got the olds, right? So that you have to factor mm, oh, that yeah. too, right? So, it's supposed to be you know, one of the perks of living in the city and paying city taxes that you don't have to do shit like that. Right? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> this, is my, this is my argument exactly. I can just take the train, go here, there, CSO, whatever, snark you, and it's all there, right? But mm -hmm. these guys like St. Charles. Even I've played that theater. I can't defend it. It's, very, it's a very strange choice. <laughs> but I may, I, I still haven't made up my mind. Well, I heard that uh, night one was tremendous. So on the night one of the tour. So I think the, I think the second show is tonight, I think something like that. They're in uh, Canada, um, but they're in like <laughs> Quebec and I think Montreal tonight. Yeah. So, sure that's why I can't go in, that's uh, way really right. I would have went to Toronto if they went there, but they didn't. Not yeah. this time. First show was at the Keswick Theater. Yeah. 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 I was away for that, but uh, I heard that both Neil and Mike Portnoy uh, gave a call out to Nearfest for being their first show, which is kind of cool. Yeah, I remember that show. Yeah, me too. Well. That was a good one. Yeah, that was really good. Oh. Actually, it was a rough one for them. They, they very rough, that. very rough. <laughs> they they remember how they wheeled that melody, little baby melody with 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 ear cans. Yeah, yeah. Like there's the there's a shield. Like, all right, is my daughter here? Yeah, we got pictures <laughs> of that somewhere. Yeah, it was fun. Now she's she's all grown up and she is in uh, uh, what uh, acting school and all that and doing great. So that's yeah. pretty awesome. That's awesome. Nice. <laughs> all right, Rick, your first choice of the day. Okay, well, all the choices that I would do are band that I just stop at that discography for whatever reason. Maybe like what we we're saying from the seventies or somewhat. I'm usually a completist, want to complete everything, but if there's a major lineup change, sometimes I can't get past it. It's the wonder that I didn't, you know, I, you know how I am with UI Heap. They had a lot of changes, and I, I followed it through faithfully. But it was Pete Channel that got me back to these bands. So every one of these examples are bands that I kind of like, okay, I got the best, and I didn't think I need more and uh, until Pete talked about in an album and it got my curiosity and before you know it, I'm back on the bang wagon. And so the example I'm gonna give, I'm gonna start with this one, probably uh, more recent, uh, is Styx. And I know it sits in a prog feet seat because of some of the albums they have done and some of the songs, but mainly because the more recent albums are very prog in nature. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. at the Damn time good. I stopped that, uh, the last album was caught in the act forever because why could Tommy Shaw and Dennis DeYoung were actually getting along? Well, not really at that time, but you know what I mean? It was their album out. They didn't continue. And so when that lineup changed, I just never gave Edge of the Century a shot. What is the other one? Cyclone, nothing like that. Here. And, and yeah, and I never gave anything up, but I did see them in concert when they went on tour in 1997, the return of the Paradise, Paradise uh, Theater. And it was amazing. And I'm like, oh, this was, to me, that was, everything I loved about the 70s and I'm watching the greatest hits and they're performing so awesome. The only lineup change was the, the drummer, right? The good drummer, you know, awesome. died from age mm -hmm. or whatever. And, but his brother was still in the band as the bass player. And so I'm like, wow, I'm seeing this band that who would have thought they would even come back? Cause I remember the whole period of the eighties, this band broken up. So I appreciate that, but I never went and followed what album they put out after. And especially when I knew Dennis DeYoung wasn't in the band, so I didn't even give the mission and uh, you know the latest one, 
uh, the crash of the crown a chance at all until Pete kept saying it over and over saying that this is a really good record once you get past that because don't get me wrong Tommy Shaw is a big part of what I love about the band but Dennis DeYoung was to me the ringmaster of the circus act like he was the I love theater too so when I saw him Larry Gowan's great I thought they were so great together and I didn't know they had this friction. So it's actually just disappointing. You know, it was just like going to the time I went to see Deep Purple and then I didn't know there was a personnel change and there was Joe Lynn Turner and I like him, but I wanted Ian Gillen and it was like hard for me to get past it. It wasn't until I had every Deep Purple and live album where I'm thinking there's one more that's still out there. And I finally went and bought it. I didn't do it like this. This one, because my buddy Pete said it was good and I didn't, I wasn't disappointed. I got this, and I'm like, wow, this is great. i really impressed with it. I loved what they did. And to, even my girlfriend wants me to have it playing in the background. Is one of those prog bands I can get away with. Uh, so anyway, I just thought that was an SOT moment. It was like taking blind faith that he said, you know what? They still got that fire in the tank. And I've been giving a lot of legacy bands another shot because they've been proven they're worthy of that. You're right, he, Judas Priest, you know, all these bands. Deep Purple, they're putting out still good records. So why doesn't that apply to sticks? Only because of personality change? I said, I got to get past that. So I took that chance, and I'm glad. Now I'm going to get the other two because I'm almost there. Might as well get the rest of it. <laughs> the <laughs> curse is real. Yep. Don't, 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 put, don't get too much hopes for Edge of the Century. I'll just say that. Well, I'm, listen. Yeah, it's got its moments. Oh, the Cyclorama. It has a few. That's Cyclorama a few. is really good. I, I yeah, like it. It is really good. Mm-hmm. But people didn't know this, but let me tell you, one of our shows, uh, I was given a hard time calling the station Genesis. I didn't like the brand because Phil wasn't on there. And I wasn't even given a chance, again, because I didn't want change. And my buddy Chad down there uh, sent me a copy. And you know what? It's a decent record. I still don't want it to be Genesis because of the brand. I but I did appreciate it a little bit more than being just closed-minded because it was a change. So thank you for that, Chad. You're welcome. Yeah, I don't know if you guys know. So Larry Gowan, his first solo album was called, I think it was his first one called Lost Brotherhood. Alex Lifeson actually plays on a song or two on that. Nice. Oh, cool. Well, that's a good reason right there. Yeah, he's, he's got some really amazing. good solo stuff. Yeah. Okay. And what's interesting is I, I wonder how many people watching the show stopped buying Sticks albums after the live album caught in yeah. the act. I wonder. And I, I would like that for you guys. And I went and saw them a couple of times together, but no, I just wouldn't buy anything else until SOT came in my life. I think a lot of people did give Edge of the Century a chance because Dennis was still there. You know, they did get they had Glenn Burtnick at the time, yep. and he was fine. Yeah, because you were uh, with the damn Yankees, right, Tommy, at the time? So Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but... Yeah, I don't think it was the Sticks album people were hoping for. It was a little, yeah. a little later in, in AOR. Lightweight, lightweight. As someone who's been listening to Sticks for a good chunk of my life, I have found that Sticks without Tommy doesn't quite work for me. I mean, the early stuff, notwithstanding, I'm talking about, you know, like right. Sticks since he's been in the band. You take him out of the equation, it's not quite the same. You take Dennis out of the equation, and it kind of hurts as well, but. Mr. Gowan has kind of filled that role. Oh, right? he's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and it's really no disrespect good. to Dennis. No, um, and I find I just, I, I don't know if I could deal with a sticks without Tommy Shaw at this point. I just don't think I could. Well, you know, with Todd Schumer, he's a great drummer too. And he's such a personal guy, man. Great. Yeah. yeah. Really good. Nice mm-hmm. guy. Yeah, Amazing. Nice guy. All right, Eric, back to you. So my number two, like Steven, I write for the website. And this was a band that I got, I get a box of CDs every once in a while from Pete and I'm going through it, looking to see what came through. And I'm like, huh, this is interesting. I've got a new album here from a band, Strubs. And back again, probably going back to the late eighties, early nineties, when I was exploring Prague, I read about Rick Wakeman and Rick Wakeman had played with them for a time. And I went out and bought from the Witchwood. Um, this Everyone absolutely loves. killed me when mm-hmm. I got this here on heroin. I love That's these my guys. Favorite. And go. Yeah. Go. I think I might have bought um, 
Brave New World. And so I had those three and that was it. But when Pete sent this and I reviewed it, I really liked this. And I think this is 2021, so it's fairly recent. And again, I, I think at that time, exploring Prague and reading about all these bands, <laughs> wanting to hear them, you know, I got two or three Straubs. And I think when you look that stuff up, that's considered kind of their golden period when you're in their hero and heroine. And, um, and you just start finding these other bands. And I've gone back to them. I don't, you know, I, I don't know if I've ever not listened, but it had been a while. Um, and when Settlement came, I just, I went right back. I played those three. Um, I picked up a couple others uh, since. So I built it. And again, that's a band, Pete, that you were saying, they have a pretty large catalog. So I don't know how far I'll go, but I went from three to about six or seven since I reviewed that one because I picked up a couple of the other earlier ones that I didn't have. Um, but I have no, I, that's another one. I don't know that I truly have an explanation for it because I remember being absolutely blown away by, by uh, heroin, heroin, by just killed me. And I listened to that a lot when I got it. Um, and even talking about personnel, I think that's one of the interesting things. We're all around the same age. And I remember getting into Genesis and telling people that Trick of the Tail is my favorite. And they're like, really? You like a Phil Collins record better than Gabriel? I had no attachment. Now, granted, when Hackett and those guys left, that starts, things start going south. But for me, sometimes you listen to these bands and all of a sudden, like even Wishbone Ash, you know, they had personnel changes. And, but, you know, I bought kind of a wide, I had Argus, I had uh, New England, which had different guitar players, I think on those. And, you know, I, it didn't affect me as if I was with a band from start to finish. So, um, but that's my number two, I guess, the Straubs. And there's a lot left to buy. I don't know that I'll get there, but um, I've definitely added to the collection since I reviewed Settlement uh, last year. Cool. You're back on that bandwagon. Mm -hmm. All, right. All right. My I next choice. Actually, just one thing quickly. I have to shamefully uh, admit that that was the one band that I, I, I did not, I walked out on them at Nearfest, the Straubs. They were, everybody talked them up so much. I thought, all right, this is going to be great. And me and Jeff, that we used to go there to these together, we had a rule. Like, it was like three songs decide whether we stay or leave, right? And at the end of the third, you're just showing me the orifice that it, it's time for a punch and to walk out. And that was it. And um, so, yeah, I've, I've never, I'm, I've, I've always been curious about, about that band because I don't understand why they have all the things I like, but somehow I just. I have a hard time with it. his vocals. For it, me. It's something, it's something. It's, it's just, um, they have the ingredients, but the cake doesn't taste good to me. I don't know why. Yeah. Can't like everything, right? Mm -hmm. I hear, I mean, fish. Sound there seems sounds like there's a lot of influence in fish from those vocals from the straws. I think he's another one of those singers that take from the school of Roger Chapman without being like Roger Chapman. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> right now, some of those classic albums are a lot of fun to listen to. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hero and heroin mm -hmm. and Grave New World. Yeah, and Ghost. Mm -hmm. Ghost man, I love that album. Mm -hmm. All right, I don't have a hard copy of this next one because I couldn't find it back <laughs> late today. But uh, this is a perfect example of buying into the hype and really liking it. And then just that's as far as you go. So when I was first getting into Prague big time, uh, one of the things I wanted to do was to get every Prague album that was named a classic and get you know all the classics by the classic bands and all that kind of stuff and one of the albums that was kept getting promoted to me also happened to contain a little section of music that was in my favorite horror film of all time the exorcist right so i went out and got mike oldfield tubular bells and i was like all right everybody's saying this is one of the great albums of all time one of the great musicians of all time I'm like cool and i got it and I was like, yeah, this is really good. This is kind of different. I really dig this really good, 
musician and the compositions are kind of cool it's symphonic it's orchestral it's proggy it's avant-garde and i'm like oh this is excellent and i listened to it a ton and i never bought another mike goldfield album ever mm -hmm. and i have over the years i've heard lots of people especially on this channel on this show people talk about all these other albums that he's released that are so good and i'm all like yeah i should check those out because i like tubular bells and then like steven said i just I never do. And I just, <laughs> just a couple months ago, I think I, it was Rand Kelly or something on one of the other shows. He was talking about like either the album after the one after that. And, and I, I went and listened to a little bit on YouTube. I was like, that was pretty damn good. I got to get this. And I never did. And I don't know what the deal is with Mike Oldfield, but I just don't ever take that next step. And it's been like 30 some odd years. And I just, I have not bought anything else by the guy. I don't know why. Because I like everything I've heard. I love tubular bells. And it's just like, but I'm just like, I think part of me is like, you know, am I gonna go buy more stuff, more of his stuff and then maybe never listen to it? I don't, I don't know. I don't I, I don't have an explanation for it. It's a big mystery because I know mm -hmm. so many people have been like, Mike Oldfield is like, you know, he's one of the greats. And I'm like, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I don't know why it I hasn't did a similar, completely. I did a similar me. thing, and the only thing I ever bought, the only other thing I ever bought was Omadon. The same here, Omadon. I'm like, eh. Mm. <laughs> same, Pete. Yeah. I have two same more bells. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've got lots. I'm the same way, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, like, yeah, I remember we did a show together. You you named some of the stuff. Yeah, so uh, yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. 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 Like and and I, I remember listening, listening to you, and I'm kind of like, oh, this sounds great. This sounds great. I just like, never go and do anything about it. Yeah. Yeah. Very strange. One of life's mysteries. So anyway, on to George. And number two is uh, around the same time as my number one, late 90s, 1998. The first uh, online prog community I found was this board called Perpetual Motion. It's where I met Ken. And when I found Sorry. it, the first, first two bands they're talking about was Ice Age, who I checked out and it kind of left me a little flat. And the other one was Pain and Salvation. And I was got one hour by the concrete lake and was totally blown away. So I start following them. They become a top five band for me, um, culminating with this one, Remedy Lane. This is a masterpiece. If anybody hasn't heard it, it's completely great. Um, but after this, it's like, okay, the next one comes out, and I don't like the whole idea of it. I heard it, and I was like, yeah, I'm the fence about it. And then the guy starts – he's a difficult guy, to put it mildly. He starts – He's the kind of guy you hear stuff about and he makes you not want to give him the benefit of the doubt and listen to his music. And when the music's not where it was, that kind of plays into it. And then your buddies hate him. And it's like, so the next album came out. I did hear it. I liked a few songs, but again, it's not enough to pull me back in the fold. After that, I didn't hear anything. I mean, just people would, I'd hear people talking about the concept of it. He did a double double album where he's trying to recreate the seventies and he did a covers album. And he, I just, I never checked back in. He did a really hideous cover of Holy Diver. You got to, got to hear that if you want to hear a really bad cover. <laughs> but uh, I, I do have a couple of friends that are fanboys. So I did check back in for my first whole album. Listen for in the passing light of day. And it's back in the style, but it's not of the same quality to me. And then, you know, I, I've stayed out of them. I never have gone back with Pain oh. Salvation, but I'm off the bandwagon completely, I guess, because I just don't, there's nothing about me, about them that I want to go back. I'm happy with the four I got, the first four, and that's it for me. I mean, you know, the, the, the truth is, I don't think they've ever really equaled those first four albums. Yeah, that's the thing. They've had some good ones. They have. They've had a couple ones that aren't so good, but uh, I've stayed with them, but I don't, I don't get the enjoyment from that band like I used to. I still like them. I still follow them. I still buy their stuff. But I, I don't know. I a couple of those early albums border on genius, and I, mm, I don't know if I'd call any of their more recent ones anything close to that. Fun stuff, good, good material, but not quite. Well, they 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 re, they changed the band completely, right? Yeah. They, they that was the thing. They 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 were. I, don't, I mean, I don't know the guys very well. I've, I've, I've talked to Daniel a couple times. That's about it. Um, yeah. Well, you know, the, George scoped out one of mine. So I have to think. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. 
All right, Chuck. About him, he can't he can't get along with his band members. He's one of those guys that's constantly changed. Oh, yeah. But but where I the, the the only disagreement to have with everything I agree with everything every word you said except that I do really like in the passing in the passing light of day. I saw that tour when they came here. They played at Reggie's, and they had that guy from Iceland that that who was the second singer who could sing even higher than Daniel. Yeah, yeah. That he got into a fight with, and now he's no longer in the band. That <laughs> band. <laughs> that band was unbelievable and a lot of those songs were written by the iceland guy like they existed in previous records that the guy had released under his own name yeah so then they just sort of became pen of salvation songs they fought whatever people fight in bands but but i thought that what won me over was the show and what lost me again immediately is when i knew that that guy was gone because that the, the that iceland guy is what what gave me hope that okay they're going in the right direction I can I can sort of dig this again, but yeah, I'm interesting. It's interesting you didn't like it. I thought I thought you might have liked it more. But. That's my favorite of their latter period albums. Yeah, for sure, without a doubt. <laughs> I mean, otherwise, Panther. They should have called it the Pink Panther. I only heard the radio songs, and that was enough for me. Was... <laughs> yeah. So, all right, Chuck, what do you got? Oh man, well, this one you know, to that. Um... Was was probably the first band that I fell in love with in the prog realm, which is Yes. Um, loved them very much. The first album that I ever purchased with my own money, um, which it was Yes Songs, because I just loved that live album so much, man. Um, but so that got into them when I was in high school, and um, but so that and I played, I had bought everything from them, and used to listen to everything. And, you know, I've mentioned a few times how what's a um, Yes album, you know, I hadn't listened to that album in like over almost 20 years because I prefer all the live versions of the songs that are on there. But, um, you know, what's that? I listened to, the, um, to them to the point where I can no longer take John Anderson's voice. You know, um, what's that? I, I actually stopped uh, at um, Big Generator and I didn't listen to them for many years. Until I, until some of my buddies um, actually got um, started streaming their shows, um, and then that's when I started listening to Yes again, but not to the extent that I I used to when I first got into them. You know, they were once again they were like my first band, and I just can't can't really listen to them as much anymore. You know, especially now that Chris Squire is um, deceased, and then you know like they have this band over here, and then you have this band over here. And no John Anderson. So, you know, I just can't listen to them. I fell off the bandwagon with those guys. And I think I'll probably just stay that way when it comes to yes. Mm -hmm. Sure, there are others that feel the same way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Anthony, Jeff. we're looking right at you, buddy. The curse is on me. <laughs> All right, what do you got, Chad? Okay, well, my second one uh, is a band that really showed up uh, kind of suddenly for me, even though they had a couple albums ahead of time. And we booked them for it was '94, and that band is Niacin. So, and you hmm. guys, you guys know how oh, hot this time did crunch. You just hold up time crunch. Yeah. Is that what that was? Time crunch. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you know. Billy Sheehan, John Novello, Dennis Chambers, monsters, right? This album is killer from beginning to end. We had them at Nearfest. They were phenomenal. Um, I guess at one point, Magna Carta had sent me the live album, which actually, this live album is actually right before Time Crunch. And then the one after it being organic, which is also quite good. It's not quite Time Crunch, it's still quite good. Um, and I spun the crap out of Time Crunch. I listen to that album all the time. And I guess I listened to Organic maybe twice and just never went back to it. And then recently, um, I don't know what caused me. I just started thinking about the song Elbow Grease because that's just a killer Love intro. Song. Mm -hmm. <laughs> First song on the album, it's, it's ridiculous. There's a great version of Blue Wind on here from uh, you know, Jeff Beck. But I mean, it's a version of Red. Forgot about that. Um, but it, it's, I don't know if it was something that was just, like it was so hot and then just flamed out for me. And I never went back to any of their, their previous albums. They had four, three, three, three previous uh, studio albums and yet another live album before all of this. And then one album after it in 2013 called Crush. Um, 
never bothered to go after any of that. It's just like, maybe that was enough for me. Um, it was all, maybe it was all focused around that live performance, uh, the near fest performance and how great that was watching Dennis chambers on his double bass drums and, and, and all that stuff and watching the other two guys just go ape shit on their instruments. Um, but I just kind of stopped listening to it. It's just like, I was all right, done with that. Put it in the, put it in the collection. And then recently, like I said, I just started thinking about that song and I, I, I flipped through the album and checked out a couple of the songs, um, you know, almost like a, like, just like a sampler, like, Oh, do I remember this? Do I remember that? I'm like, you know what, this was a really hot album. I need to go back to it. So, um, I, will I go back and buy the older albums? No, I don't think so, but I'm certainly going to go back and revisit these two. Um, really, a, a, a good reminder of this, how good and smoking hot this, you know, this organ driven, prog funk whatever you want to call it just a, just really a great trio so um yeah they're my number two that's a good choice i listened to those albums a ton when they first came out i don't think i've listened to any of them in 10 years probably more yeah <clears throat> yeah i'm in the same same ballpark as you on that lewis all right so my second band is the tangent this is a band that um when they first came out with uh, uh you know i forget what the first album was called let me just try to remember um yeah the music that died alone right that, that, that was the one really? i love that record yeah and um i i didn't know it i didn't know anything about andy tillison i didn't know i i, I knew that he was sort of using guys from the flower kings and other people to sort of work and um that didn't bother me in the least because that's just the nature of how musicians have to get by you know and i i bought the follow-up you know auto buy without even listening to it i i liked it fine and i kept up listening and buying up until not as good as the book right which didn't bother me it it, it, it has that idiosyncratic andy tillison compositional style it's like a little bit canterbury a little bit symphonic prog it's it's that that's his that's his style it's perfectly fine but then i don't know why there was nothing offensive about it there was, i just completely lost touch and they've released a ton of albums since 2008 right i have not heard a single one and i have not bought them and as I was preparing for this show, I, I realized I have no good reason for that hmm. at all. They're all pretty because good. I, I don't doubt yeah. it because this guy puts a lot of thought into what he does. He's not an idiot, right? So, but, <laughs> but for reasons that I cannot defend or justify other than, you know, mental lagoons, somehow I, I just stopped getting those records. And now what stops me, as was being mentioned before, is that I have a gap of about five, right? Or seven or uh, however many, let's see, Down and Out in Paris and London, uh, Calm, Le Sacre du Travail, a Sparky the Ether, The Slow Rust, The Forgotten Machinery, holy shit, Proxy, <laughs> and then Auto Reconnaissance. Like, come on, I, man. And a new one on the way. <laughs> yeah, so, so at this point, I guess I'm just going to tap out and admit that I, you know, but, but, um, or not if i if i can buy if i can find them at a reasonable price i might you know i might just buy one on a whim but but it's a band that i love and andy is the sweet sweet guy and i i i'm glad he's been working i'm glad that he's he's with inside out and he's putting out his stuff but i just sort of you know they just but, fade i mean you bring, this I, is another good point this is another factor here so here we have a fairly well, recent is relative, right? You know, last 20 years, right? A fairly recent band who is pretty prolific. They're on a label that cranks out product like crazy. And probably most of the releases don't get the promotion or attention they deserve, not only from 
the label and the media, but from us, the listeners, right? Because you just can't keep up with everything. It's just coming out, boom, 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 you know, inside out and frontier yeah. and all these labels just every other week, every other day, there's some three new releases come out. Four came out today, two next week. It's just like, so a band like The Tangent for me, because I totally agree with you, I've lost track of, of, of a good chunk of their last half a dozen albums. Yeah. I, just, I can't keep and, up with this stuff. And, and they only ever played the one time in the States, right? At Ross Fest, I think. Mm, yeah. I saw that show and then that was it, right? So there was no opportunity to go to the merch table and, and, and pick up some shit, right? Like there, there was just, I, I just completely, they faded out of my, 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 my consciousness in a way. Which is a shame because I, I I really respect that guy's work, but I just stopped listening. You know, I don't I don't have a good reason. I just did. Well, m- maybe Andy will be watching the show and you'll get a package in the mail that'll have all those CDs. <laughs> well, maybe or maybe he'll just send me a, a packet of vitamins for my brain. But either way, <laughs> you know, um, I, um, I I just want to shout out to the tangent and encourage people to really. Uh, go and buy those records and and listen to them because they're, they're really great stuff. I yeah. just um, the first four for sure I can vouch for because I own them and they're fantastic, right? Um, I have no reason to think that that Andy suffered an aneurysm or a change of personality and now the other stuff is crap. I don't believe that for a second. So so I gotta think they're good, you know. Well, I know Stephen has kept up on the music very closely, so he could probably yeah. get us a little. Something. I mean. The- the albums sound like the tangent realistically they exactly. haven't changed massively they do kind of you know alter mood and tone from album to album they're not all just the same over and over and universally they're excellent yeah i mean yeah. They, they do in prog terms crank them out but that is as you say that's also the modern life of a musician yes if you're not prolific then you're not you disappear these days so it has yeah. to be. So yeah, if you've liked what they've done before, you'll still like them now. Yep. I have no doubts, Stephen. I have no doubts. Cool. All right, Stephen, your next pick. Something that struck me is, as we're you know talking through these, I'm, we're trying to put our finger on why we've fallen away from certain things. Because age-wise, most of the biggest prog acts were kind of been and done by the time I got into the music, realistically. I mean, they've all continued on and some have come back in great form, some haven't. But realistically, most of my prog rock buying was done retrospectively. It was done in the way that we spoke about when we did the the Queen show in the UK Connection uh, at the weekend there, where I got into an album or a band at probably a later date and thought, okay, I've missed the boat here because they were recording and releasing great albums when I was two. So I need to go back and find out. And I was able to go to a record store and flick through secondhand product and take a chance on things for really not very much money. So you could come home with 12 albums and I've spent 15 pounds, 20 pounds. And it was much easier to say, do you know what? I'm going to go and buy six of that band's albums that I've never heard before. And when I came to do this as an exercise, I realized that I couldn't choose really any heritage acts. There are some that I haven't investigated at all, interestingly enough, that's a different show maybe. But the ones that I did, well, I've managed to snap up all the catalog and I've got them all, whether they're good, bad or indifferent, because it didn't cost me very much. And I think that some of the latter day bands, for example, Transatlantic, if I'd seen these albums secondhand in Iraq, I'd have bought them. I would have them in my collection. And the same goes for Coheed and Cambria. Okay, because this was an excellent band. They may still well be an excellent band because I just don't know. This is the album that I came in at, which is the third album, even though it's got a big four on the front, because they call their albums things like Good Apollo, I'm Burning Star 4, Volume 1, From Fear Through the Eyes of Madness. I do like a stupid album title, but there you go. This is great, and I played this a lot. I played this a lot when it came out. And something else I thought about when I came to do this was there's not really anybody else, certainly that hasn't just followed and maybe copied them, that sounds like Coheed and Cambria. So I didn't think, well, do you know what? I don't need to buy other albums by then because there's somebody else doing it better. But I did go and buy, I went backwards. I bought the first two albums 
okay, which are volumes, different things and whatever, nothing falls in order. They're all linked, they're all concepts, they're all comics, they're, it's all the shit I like. It's a gimmick. Oh, I'm in, right? <laughs> and it continues on from this. I went, I went and bought the album that came after. This is, this is great. This is really good. And the one that came after that, this is really good too. And I have no idea what they've done since then, and I have no idea why. I think they've got four albums, and I only think that because I think I looked earlier today. <laughs> so I actually can't quite remember if it was four or five or <laughs> whatever it was. I thought, I better go look and see if actually, you know, was this kind of the last thing they ever did, and they just disappeared and I didn't know. <clears throat> well, no, but they might have done, because I just don't know. And I don't know why I don't know, but I just don't know. So my next pick is Coheed and Cambria. These are all really good albums. It's exactly what Lewis said. These are really good. I like them all. I'll happily go and listen to these anytime. And there's half the catalog is just missing from my collection for no good reason. They just fell off the radar and they've never climbed back on. They're from, I will they're from Pete's neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. One little thing. I saw them on that on one of those tours in Chicago. I, I'd never heard them or of them. And I didn't realize that their drummer was opening for them as a comedian. <laughs> the, the drummer went know. out on stage. So, so let me describe the craziness of the scene. They were playing nothing but Coheed and Cambria songs over the PA before anybody, anything started. Then the, the lights go down and this little dude walks out and he's telling jokes, or he thinks he's telling jokes. <laughs> and um, people are, are, are not really laughing with him. It was a very strange phenomenon. And now I'm starting to get irritated. <laughs> and then the, the, he seems to be getting irritated himself because the jokes are not landing. And he, 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 he makes a little speech and disappears. And then there's a very long pause. Let's go back up. And you're wondering, what the hell is this? And then they go back on and they play this lengthy show. There was a guy with a big hair playing the guitars. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was it was a very, very, very surreal night. And it, it, it made me think, these do, are these guys like a real band or a comedy thing? Like an Andy <laughs> Kaufman thing that I'm not understanding? It was very weird for me because I had never seen them. I just got to say that uh, I... They, I have a lot of questions about that band. I, I don't know. They're a talented band, actually. And, uh, they are, man. Yeah. I had a couple of their albums on CD, and I remember seeing them open up for Black Sabbath at Madison Square Garden. They did not go over well. No. Ooh, ooh. I'm oh, not no. going to imagine not like that. Oh. Yeah, this is, uh, this is the Heaven and Hell, you know, D, the last oh. year with Dio. Yeah, they are the, the, the wrong band for that. Yeah, it was not a good yeah. fit at all. Not a good fit at all. Well, that's a good choice. Rick. Okay. Um, very similar to what Stephen was saying. I think when you go look in, in your past bands of the past that happened while you were still in diapers for quite a while, um, you get all the historian albums. You get the main, main thing, but do you follow the whole discography because you're trying to get all these bands that you love, and it's a lot to catch up. So it's a lot of juggling act. And this channel, again, two times kind of we uh got me back on the band wagon with this band and it's not because i stopped loving them i liked it it's just that the wheel didn't just kept spinning i never went the next album over and i just kept sticking with the same album that I had and i'm talking about just at all i stayed with the 70s all the way up to basically bursting um bursting on i thought okay that probably end the chapter you know like rush every three every live album kind of got kind of tells a little story of that period of the time. And I thought maybe the best years of them, it, of the Jethro Tull is all here. I don't need anything out. And I thought like that for quite some time uh, because Thick as a Brick is still my favorite. And then then Benefit, then Aqua Lung, and, and then Passion Play, I love all that. So I didn't think, and I started getting to this point, I thought they probably plateau. And then watching one of Pete's shows uh, like I faithfully do because I love ranking the way albums, right? And uh, and he was ranking Jethro Tull and he talked about the other albums of the 70s that I didn't get past that. And I was Stormwatch and, you know, uh, the Song of the Wood, Heavy Horse. I'm like, oh my God, I, I'm, I'm neg being neglected here. Uh, so I went and got those, right? And so, and it ended there. 
79 last album <laughs> okay that's it until we did that homework as to i mean that homework but the battle between russ signal and you know uh broad the sword beast. and the beast right and i'm like i enjoyed that record so i went and got that and then it got my curiosity to i grab a couple of more since then but i would just you know i love the band i seen them in concert but i just like i said i went to that point of the discography and i said okay i think that's that that's it you know and i kept just playing them until uh, uh, Pete recommended other stuff, other stuff, and I said, I gotta check that out. And then I really liked it. I felt like, man, I would have missed out. And again, well, another example of a big catalog too, right? That can be kind right. of, you think you have all their best, and you're like, yeah, I got all I need, right? But well, another great. example of Pete being a bad influence too. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm here for, real. right? <laughs> I, I, I think it's a good influence. I, I, I'm yeah. happy that I discovered this this channel. I, Me I've, too. A lot of shit I would have never heard between Pete and George. It's like holy crap. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm taking notes. I remember the, uh, the first half of the pandemic was just fucking note taking. And to think how arrogantly <laughs> I thought I had everything. Like honestly, I have thousands of CDs, and then Pete brings all these other gems I had no idea of, and it's like amazing. Yeah. There's always the surplus of stuff you haven't heard, guys. It's just yes. the way it goes for every one of us. Yep. Cool. All right, Eric, back to you for your final pick. My final pick is an artist where I followed him um, with his band, Spock's Beard. And after he left Spock's Beard, followed his solo career. And this may be going back to Stephen with Transatlantic. Maybe it's an oversaturation. And I don't think I really fell off the bandwagon. But again, Pete and I saw Neil Morse two months ago, Pete, something like that. Yep. And it just, so when we were going to see him, I hadn't had the new record. So I picked up Innocence and Danger from Neil Morse Band. And that live show just kind of revved me up and I had pretty much everything. But then when I started to look, I'm like, oh, okay. I don't have the great adventure and I don't have solo gratia. And I, I know that I, I I'll say this. I think I purposely skipped Jesus Christ, the exorcist, just because I thought, uh oh, that might be a little too much. Um, but I had, I think almost everything else. And then seeing them live, I went back and bought great adventure like i said i picked this up prior to the show so i don't know that it really fell off the bandwagon i almost think it's like an oversaturation you had his solo career you had neil morse band you have flying colors you have transatlantic there's just so much neil morse yeah. and i honestly when they were touring i'm like okay they have to have something and then i realized oh i didn't get the last two and then oh i missed the last two or three of his solo career so for me, I think, and it was the same with Wishbone Ash, just seeing a band live and, and both were fantastic when we saw them. And it really kind of revs you up. And I'm like, I got to go back and get the rest of this. So I am one short on the solo stuff because I did not go for uh, Jesus Christ, the Exorcist. But you guys it's not can bad. tell me it's not bad. if I'm missing. Okay. Um, but it's that's a little, it. It's a little over the top, but it's not bad. Is it? Okay. Mm -hmm. So other than that, I filled the gap after the show. So I think I had three or four that I might've been missing, but I, I've always liked him. I've always liked the music. I think he's a great writer. He's got a great sense of melody. There is a sameness at times and maybe that oversaturation because he's released a lot of stuff over the years. And then having those other bands and offshoots, there's a lot of Neil Morse product out there. Oh yeah, yeah. So, but Eric, that's, my, that's my last one for tonight. Eric, what, what, what do you, um... What's a, would you say that Neil is basically this era's Phil Collins? Well, I know he's done a, I, and I'll say I didn't buy his like singer songwriter stuff, but I know he's done some more poppier material. Um, he's obviously got his, um, with his religious affiliation, he's done some mm -hmm. of those types of albums. He's just so prolific. I, I mean, he may even go, although he doesn't have that widespread name that Phil Collins had. I mean, I think he almost goes beyond Phil Collins in terms of how Phil played with a lot of people mm -hmm. and did that. But I mean, Neil Morris is just like band, band, solo, new band. Always recording, always writing, always playing. Right on, I agree. Yeah. 
there's just so much out there with him on it. Um, but in but, truth, that is also a reason why it is a little samey. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, there, 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 there's no shame in that because if you happen to love that, then you're just getting an overdose of what you love. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And even with the Transatlantic, I bought yeah. his version. I didn't buy the uh, Ronnie Stolt mix, I guess, or whatever. Is. That's kind of how they did that. Um, because I I like Neil better than I like uh, uh, Ronnie Stolt, so I went with that version. Um, but you're right. There's probably a sameness to it because there's. I don't want to say a formula because I don't think he sits and works everything out, but he's got his own sound. He's got his own thing. And I you know think, it's Neil when you hear it, right? Yeah, exactly. I, yeah, I, you also scoped out one of my choices, but I, I think, I think you're right. I, I think, I think, uh, I think he benefited a lot from the Neil Moore's band era. I, I do think that was needed. I like yeah. that shot that he got. And I think Gillette, He's letting those guys sing, so it's not always Neil it's a out. Really front. good band. I mean, and the guy, the, really I, I, I'm brain farting because I'm, I'm old on, on the on the keyboard horn player's name. Bill Huber, really, is it? Bill yeah. Bauer, yeah. Yeah, okay. that guy is an amazing musician. Also, he is. good singer and, too. And, and Randy George, just you know, so, so it's, it's a great band. Yeah, you know, yeah. But, yeah. Team. but you know, that's it is a little yeah. for me. Yeah. That's a cool choice. Um, all right, so my final pick of the day, this is borderline prog here. Uh, I think all the players are well-known prog guys, but this particular band is maybe not so much prog, but uh, the band is Asia. So I was all in on that first album. I still like the first album. I bought this when it came out. I kind of dug it, didn't really think it was nearly as good as the debut and i still don't think that to this day um but i still was like i was a fan right and then like a million lineup changes and john payne's asia later and all this kind of stuff i never bought another thing by this band and i have been told by many people Stephen, as a matter of fact is one of them that a lot of the John Payne era of Asia is probably stronger than any of the stuff, save for the debut that the, the, the classic lineup of the band has done. But I still never went out and bought any of it. And I just like, I never felt compelled to listen to any of it. And then like uh, when they reformed and they released those, I don't know, two or three albums with the, with the original guys, you know, the record label sent those to me and I had to review them for the web zine and everything like that. And I really wasn't impressed by any of them. And uh, I just find with these guys, I go back to the debut. I maybe tolerate this a little bit. And I, I've heard so many good things about like the 90s material, which was not with the classic lineup, but I just never felt compelled to go and get any of it. And I, I think uh, I think I might have reviewed one or two of them and thought they were pretty good, but just never, never bought them. I saw them play live in a <clears throat> Borders bookstore in Poughkeepsie, New York. <clears throat> like 15 years ago it was the weirdest thing it was like nobody there and they literally set up like this little stage in the middle of all the book racks and they played a short little set and they came out and signed things and spoke with all of us and i was thinking to myself how weird is this that asia is playing <laughs> in this tiny little borders bookstore in poughkeepsie <laughs> they had no other show pete that they weren't playing a show in okay no yeah, that's the that's weirdest strange. thing it was the weirdest thing. And I was like, at least it wasn't a puppet show. Yeah. <laughs> Which is really weird. This is really weird. But yeah, I just never, I, I don't know. And, and yeah, it's, I you know, if someone had come to me tomorrow and say, hey, uh, you want to sell me that uh, Asia Alpha for like five bucks? I'd be like, here you go. Thank you. As long as I have a debut, like the debut, I'm probably happy. That's all I need. I like the first two. I don't think Astro's that strong. I did give the, um, John Payne era a try. I thought Aqua was a deep, decent album. There's some okay stuff on Arena. Uh, I sold off Aria a long time ago, and I don't think I heard it. I don't think I heard anything else. But I go back to Aqua every once in a while. There's a couple yeah. of good songs on that. I remember I hearing like when, when, when I heard that Mandy Meyer, the uh, guitar player for uh, Crocus, <laughs> was in Asia. I was like, what? In what in what reality does that make any sense yeah. whatsoever? Outside of, 
Yeah, outside of Go and Voice of America, uh, that album. Go is a good song. I like Go a lot. That's a good song. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. So that's my last pick of the day, Asia. George. All right. My last one is uh, Fate's Warning. Um, wow. came that's in my honorable at, mention. I came in in the old days at Spectre Within. I was just blown away by the vocalist. And this is a band I could see people falling out because a lot of things. They changed vocalists, which people go crazy about. They changed levels of heaviness. Yeah. They were a, a lot heavier band, and then they got light in the 90s. But I followed through all that. I like all of it. Same. So with this one, which to me is a masterpiece. Yeah. Yep. Shade of Grey. Mm -hmm. So then there's a three-year break. I bought Disconnected. I don't remember why. I either traded it or sold it. I hadn't connected with it yet, so I obviously felt it was dispensable. But after that, I just completely fell out for 20 years. I just I didn't even hear any of those. They only had three records in the, in the medium, but I didn't hear any of them. George, came, their last two are great. At 2016, I came back in for this. I heard, yeah. I think I heard maybe the video single. I, I liked it. I love this album. But again, the last one, I didn't care for it. Really? Wow. Yeah, I just... It was maybe I didn't give it enough chances. I didn't buy it. I just streamed it a couple of times, but uh, I found it like a Peaks and Valleys album. But yeah, for those the 20 years in between Pleasant Shade of Grey and this one, I was like, they weren't even on my radar at all. Yeah, there were some kind of spotty records there. I, I mean, I went and bought them all and I some of them I never listened to at all. But uh, I, I there were a lot of other people who kind of fell off the radar with them during that period. Because that was, was high there. watermark, you know that that wonderful like concept album, and uh, then just kind of after <laughs> it was like, I don't know, they yeah, it's ex expectations game. You after that, I'm thinking this, yeah, next, and it just wasn't. And then uh, the one FWX, the guy guitar player I was jamming with at the time, he had bought it, came to practice, and is like, "You want it?" I'm like, "Whoa, <laughs> that, that's not an endorsement." You know, I didn't even take it. I was like, "No, nah, you." If you're giving it to me that quick, no, I don't want it. I it. <laughs> and, and I'll be honest, I I really during that whole period, I, I thought um, the stuff Ray was doing with Redemption was way better. Oh yeah, <clears throat> like not even close. I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, right, that's a good one. I I came in, I guess, right around their peak with uh, parallels, and I like the ones on either side. I like Perfect Symmetry. I like Inside Out. Um, Pleasant Shade of Grey is good and then uh, be, besides like a best of record that I have I don't know anything else from the, the early albums and certainly didn't buy anything after Pleasant Shade of Grey so that's a really good say, Chad, I would give the, the last two a, a shot I, I find yeah. it pretty strong yeah okay yeah yeah, yeah that, but that that would have been my um, honorable honorable mention Fate's Warning is a good choice cool yeah I can see that Chuck what do you got final pick all right Last one, um, is debating between these two, but um, at least the um, one of the bands I've gotten back into, but that's a story for another time. Um, this one, um, it's kind of tough because it's Pink Floyd. You know, that's another band that I loved um, to the point to where I can't even listen to them anymore, you know, outside of Animals. Um, What's it at? Um, the first album I ever purchased from them well, back in um, 1986 um, was... Wishing You Were Here. I have that on vinyl. I have it on CD. I have it on, um, what's a cassette? Um, what's a, it's an album that I used to love dearly. Still, actually still love it. But um, it took, it, it, I went like almost, what's a, it wasn't until I got back um, on this panel over here and so that I started listening to them again because I had stopped listening to them for nearly 30 years. You know, outside of animals, I just couldn't listen to them. You know, I couldn't listen to uh, Wishing You Were Here. Um, there was a time where I was obsessed with anything prior um, prior to metal. And I just stopped listening to them. You know, one of my buddies had asked, yeah, hey, remember we used to just, just jam and listen to that stuff? And I was like, I can't listen to them no more. But um, I fell off the bandwagon. I got back on briefly with Animals because um, I really loved that album. But other than that, I just can't find myself listening to them as much as I used to. You know, but it's Pink Floyd, and that's my number one pick. Luis would tell you to go listen to a Momentary Lapse of Reason. 
Uh-oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> only, only if I hate you. <laughs> yeah. That's probably about the time that I stopped listening yeah. to them, too. You know, because I, I listened to them, and it's so morose, man. And I'm like, geez, man, I want to just jump out of a window. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 well, to each their own, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. All right, Chad. Okay, so my my final pick, my number one for tonight, is a band that I heard of right around the time I heard of Anglo Guard. So we're talking, oh, geez, I don't know, uh, 92, 93, somewhere in there. And uh, they were sort of the two of the one-two punch out of Sweden. And that band is Anecdote. Yeah. So I heard that they were in a similar vein. So I went and I picked up b I, f- I picked up Nucleus, and then I followed them a little bit. You know, the, we had them at Nearfest 2000. Um, people fawned over Anna Sophie Dahlberg in her, her cello and her, her good looks. Uh, they put on a great brooding, heavy set. Uh, I followed along and got from within, and after that, in Gravity. I have to say, I don't know if I've ever listened to these albums. I need to go back to them. I remember liking them. I remember liking the first two a lot. Um, they became one of those things like, oh, they put out an album. I got to get the new Angle Guard. Or, um, sorry, the new anecdote. I need to add it to my collection. Then I got to a point, I'm like, well, I'm not listening to them. Maybe I shouldn't get the next one yet until I figure out if I like the third and fourth album. And then just kind of forgot about it. And uh, you know, recently, probably because of this show, I've been going through and looking at my collection. Like, all right, what have I not listened to in a long time that I probably should pull back out? And I didn't get any farther than the A's. And there's there's anecdote. Um, so, who knows what else is in the collection? Um, so, I'm going to go back and I'm going to soak in these four albums. And um, maybe I need to hunt out the last two. They, the, their most recent was 2015. So that's seven years ago, but. Um, I don't know anything about it. I remember hearing of a time of day from 07, but until all the ghosts are gone, I'm not so sure I even heard about that one. Um, I don't know if you guys know those two and how they are, but um, uh, I've got four albums of homework here for Anecdote to go back and, and soak up, and I'm looking forward to it, actually. Um, so, and then, uh, yeah, so there's my number one, Anecdote. That's a great choice. Mm-hmm. I, I know for a fact that I've reviewed something by them in the last decade. Uh, and I remember kind of liking it, but I don't even know if it's something I bought. I probably, I probably just reviewed a digital download. And I have the first two, which I think we all got at the time. And those are both great. I haven't listened to them in like a decade. And I don't think I got any of the other ones. It's one of those bands. I, we were all like, yeah, anecdote. They're awesome. Yeah. They're heavy. There's lots of Mellotron. It's Swedish. And like, yeah, I wound and up they were another spending one of those all bands, my time but... with Anglogard. And I never went back to those guys. Yeah, they were another one. They were one of the prog fests in, uh, what, 95 with 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 uh, Equilin and Anglogard and whatever. And, yeah. you know, they were one of the early stars of the, uh, the 90s push of new progressive rock. And, uh, you know, I latched on, but didn't soak in, and they just kind of went to the wayside after uh, after two thousand or so for my for my brain. So um, it's time to dive back in. I don't think they ever topped Nucleus. Nucleus is a very damn good album, mm-hmm. but they're good records, dude. You're gonna like them. They're yeah. just different. They have a different intensity. They're more a little more mellow, but they're, they're yeah. Really I remember cool. hearing that, especially about um, about Gravity. And I, I guess yeah. even from within, but more so on gravity. I, I remember hearing something along that along those lines. Yeah. They're cool. good. Lewis. All right. Since I've been scoped twice, I, <laughs> I had to, to think a little bit so I wouldn't repeat. And I think I found a good one. Like I I I was originally gonna go with Spock's beard, but I actually no, that's 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 too easy. And and and, and one that's surprising, <laughs> I think. Um, is because because Sparks Beard really did release great records, and, and I actually honestly have pretty much all of them, right? So, mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> but one band that I liked a lot, I really really liked, and I have seen them in concert four times, is Riverside. Mm-hmm. And you know the first few records, 
I own them all. I think that when they were in, uh, on Laser's Edge and all that, those records are amazing. They're great. Then I don't know what the hell happened. But again, I, I sort of, right? Then I saw them again at Nearfest. And they were awesome. And I, I remembered having drinks with them and malording them. And these guys are great fun. They're, they're just great guys to hang with. And, um, but I, for it, whatever reason. Else, hey, Luis, has anybody else on this panel been malorted? This is going to change when I go to New York. Okay. All <laughs> we're right. All getting please, please don't do it to me again. I don't need it. I don't need that. Again. Um, <laughs> except uh, Stephen, I would have to get on a, it's worth, it, it's worth getting on a plane just to malort you. But anyway, um, uh, I'm booking tickets as we speak. Yeah, um, I, I just I didn't buy whatever they was the latest record when they played Nearfest. I didn't get it at the time. I don't I don't even know what it's called. I know they've released really? several records. I, I was just looking online while we were talking, and I see that the last one that I remember is the that's probably the 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 last one that I have that I enjoy and it, it's in my head as a is Rapid Eye Movement, right? Same here. Then they did Anno Domini High Definition, which I think is what they were doing when they played the Near Fest. But then I see here that they have three other records, Shrine of a New Generation Slaves, Love, Fear, and the Time Machine, and Wasteland. And that's without getting into all the lunatic soul stuff that the, 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 the other guy also does. So. They're all terrific, Lewis. They're all terrific. I, yep. I, do, I, I don't doubt it, but whenever I've, I've been to see them live, it's a very strange thing that happens. Well, first of all, I the last time I saw them was without Piotr, mm. and Piotr was a, was a, was a good friend. I mm. it, it, it just I I commend them for going out and doing it because it's the, it's their it's their life's work and, and they have to do it right. But for me as a fan, it was a little weird. Because that guy wasn't just his style; it's also his vibe and what he brought to them, the personality, right? That that was missing. The guy they got to play with them is a perfectly competent, awesome player, but it just didn't have it for me. It's like me; I I, I had a real I, for many, many, many years. I, I couldn't see the Who without John Entwistle. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't do it, you know. And, and, and I'm not. Who am I to criticize Pino? Right? No, great nobody. basis. Mm -hmm. But it's not the same thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I haven't bought any of these records. I before we we came on, I did I did um, I did check on this, and apparently the last time I saw them live, which is the time that they were um, playing with that Piotr, I did buy, or somebody gave me. I, I don't know. I don't have any, a clear recollection because maybe there was a lot of alcohol involved. But I do have a copy <laughs> of the Wasteland. I have no idea what it sounds like. None, like mm. uh, zero, and and um, when I see them live, I, I just um, the early songs immediately grab me, and the other songs, the the later ones, the ones that I don't recognize, to me, they feel like I'm running on sand. Mm. I don't know how to explain it. They they don't hang together in the same way. There was just something about those early records that was borderline magical for me. And then, and then because I unfairly, maybe I'm expecting to hear more of that. And I'm not actually, I'm disappointed because I'm not hearing the album I wish they would make rather than me just not being stupid and listening to the album they actually fucking made, right? Mm -hmm. this, is, this is, so I, I'm fully admitting that this is my problem. But um, I I sort of lost touch with them and I and I and, and I feel terrible about it. Uh, so this is like a mea culpa, but because I, I love these guys, they're great people, all of them, right? They're, they're great dudes, and um, I I wish them nothing but continued success. But but I just sort of got disconnected from their 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 music after that third record somehow. I don't, I can't explain it, but mm -hmm. um but it happened, and uh, it's not for a lack of quality. Because those guys are good. When you hear them live, I mean, they are tight. They're well rehearsed. They, they have a very good sense of drama. Whoever does their lights is not an idiot. Like they, they, they everything is 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 very well put together, right? But I just can't. I don't feel the same way. It, it doesn't speak to me. I don't know why. 
It's, it's ridiculous. I feel, exactly, I feel, I feel, I feel exactly stupid saying it, but it's true, right? So I might as well fess up. I, I feel just, exactly the same way about them. Yeah. After that, I, I felt that those first three were very good. Uh, I think those songs could have been interchangeable on each album. You could have mixed them up and and I think, I think that may have yeah. been part of my issue where I felt like I got three albums of the same thing and it got samey. And I was like, I think maybe I have enough Riverside in my collection. <laughs> like the, the Lunatic Soul records are different. Yeah. They do exist in a kind of a different cohesive ecosystem, each one, right? But the, the Riverside is, is uh, in fact, um, I, tonight when we're done here, I'm going to go see Stickman playing here in Chicago at Reggie's. Um, Riverside is also playing at the Bottom Lounge. And, and uh, it, it never crossed my mind to go. And again, I feel like, I feel like such an asshole for saying that. But it, it, it's, just, it's just that, you know, that I, I, I feel like I can't, you know. It's like I have the wrong plug. I have my American laptop and I, I don't have the plug for Europe. <laughs> I, can't make, you know, like, I just can't do it, you know. Yeah, I, I had a chance for a ticket to go see them next. I think it's next Friday. They're going to be in Philadelphia, and there's just too much going on around here. I I, I can't get same with me. Yeah, they the, the label asked me if I wanted to go, and I was like, I I got too much going on. So, yeah, I will say if you're if you're at all curious or interested, what some of those latter period albums are like, uh, Stephen and I did about a year ago, I think. We spent about 90 minutes dissecting and talking and ranking that catalog, which I watched that, that show. This is what this probably is what one of the uh, yeah. one of the toughest ranking episodes we've ever had to do. Uh, yeah. because you know, in re-listening to that whole catalog again, you know, and nothing but that over the span of like a week or two before the uh, before we did the episode was was heavy, like because it's a lot of really emotional music. And uh, I think it made me realize the greatness of the catalog even more, which, you know, maybe I, I might have been close to you, Lewis, uh, before I kind of did all that in thinking, well, you know, to me, I, I, it's the first three or four albums are automatically going to be the best. And then I started like really pouring into those latter period ones. And I'm like, man, these are great as well right it's really hard it was it was really fun like we got it's like it's like one of those things like we got done doing the episode it's just like we just let out a big breath it's like wow <laughs> that was draining it's like talking about it we talked about like every song on every album and live shows and it's just man and the band's I, history and all they went through and all we've read about us it's like oof, man yeah i i, I will say that when they finished playing that show here in chicago there was a big sigh of relief from them also. Yeah, no doubt. And, and, and from the guitarist. I mean, that guy, I mean, it, it was a very emotional thing for them to do. And, and, and I'm very grateful they put themselves out there and do it because they do it well. I'm just saying it's, it's kind of shameful for me to admit it, but I, I, I just, I guess I just have to fess up and say that I, I, I have never really been able to connect with all those other records. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing yeah. wrong with that. Yeah. But, but, I, but I fully, I, I can't, what bothers me is that I just don't understand why, because it is good stuff, but it, it, does, it, doesn't, it doesn't tell me a story like the original ones did, you know? And maybe it's just like I said, I am not, I'm upset I'm not hearing what I want them to do instead of just hearing what they actually fucking did. Right. You know? And that's on me. That's not on them. But um, one of one of the I hardest mean, things of being a—I mean, it's so true. One of the hardest things of being a music fan is when you're listening to something that every ounce of you screams, "You should love this," and you yes. just don't, right? Yes. It's like, and it's even worse when you know the guys, right? And you mm -hmm. like them because if I if I know them but I don't like them, then it's easy, right? yeah <laughs> i can slag this i mean I, as, as everybody knows i went through that for decades yeah. with king's x every person i know loves these guys and everybody's like i can't believe you don't like king's x i'm like i've tried i've tried i've tried i've tried they just don't do anything for me and then it clicked yeah finally and now i'm, I'm gonna, gonna i'm gonna time. have I'm to like, do that i'm gonna look i'm gonna start with the wasteland which i have downstairs and work my go. way back you, got it. you might as well right yeah yeah <laughs> You might as well. I'm gonna give myself a heavy dose of Riverside the next week. There you go. Well, let us know what Nothing you think. But. Let yeah. us know what you think. All right, Stephen, what do you got? 
Okay, well, my last one is actually a band that I've spoken about quite a lot on the, the show over the time that I've been on it, um, which would probably give the impression that I've been on board all the way through. Uh, and it's really not true. And that is Osric Tentacles. Mm -hmm. So I, I've spoken about how I got into this band, which was I walked into Gold Rush, the much missed record store in Perth, uh, and Strange Attitude from 1991 was playing mm -hmm. and within minutes of being in the shop it was in my hand I had bought it you know I was up at the camp what is that I, I have to have that I must own that album and from there myself and my friend who was also in the store with me that day we he bought Airplant uh, and he bought Jurassic Shift and I bought Pungent Effulgent so we basically bought to that point all the catalogue then, as I've also mentioned, we went to see them in 1993, and it was not the best experience I've ever had at a gig. They didn't come on till about one o'clock in the morning. I, I, I'm not going to go into the story at any great length. Find the episode where I explain that there was a stream and a bridge, and we were on the other side of the, of, of the bridge. Okay? Lots of dance music was involved and stuff like that. It was not a good experience. And in my head, I thought, that must be where I stopped, but no, 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 no. No I cars, no cars there. were burned that evening, right? No, no, car, no cars were burned that evening. No, no car BQ. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> In my head, I thought that that gig must have been the night where I thought, well, they're not for me anymore. But no, I went and bought this gargantuan thing the next year. So this is the first five studio cassettes and a live cassette released on CD and a fantastic that's Box pretty cool. Oh, that nice. I had to go up nice. to the counter and order, you know, because they weren't getting these in. This is back in the days where people weren't doing things like this. You didn't get multi disc box sets. It was madness. So, this, I can't remember what it cost, but it can't have been cheap. And this is really good. Everything on here is really good. There's some great stuff on there. And this is a band I still go back to and listen to this quite a lot. And I haven't heard a single other song by this band for 28 years. I, I have no idea why. I, there's nothing here that I've ever disliked. I still don't dislike any of it. I still adore this album. Mm, but all of this is good. And there's lots here, there's lots. I can't tell you a name of one of their albums that was released since. Nothing, absolutely nothing about them. I'm aware that the lineup has evolved. How I don't know. Who's in them? I can't tell you. I know nothing about what they do now. I'm guessing they still sound the same because they do all kind of sound roughly the same, yeah. but I like it all. Too samey. So, but my last one is, and probably my number one, it was the one that stuck out to me immediately when this topic came up was Ozric Tentacles. Because I have spoken about them on the show, quite a lot in recent times. I've listened to these albums quite a lot in the last six months or so, and still never thought, I wonder what they did in the last 30 odd years. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go, that's my last one. That's a fantastic well, pick and I'm jealous because mm -hmm. I, I could have easily picked them as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, about it. Say, I think I had like five, maybe six of their albums. I think I was even sent one to review like, I don't know, one of their last couple, and I probably have that. And I've, I've always looked at their discoveries like, oh, I probably should get a couple more. And then, but then you listen to the albums you got, and you're like, even the ones I have, I really like, but they all kind of sound the same. And I'm thinking, well, yep. if I don't have my 10 more of them, they're all going to sound the same too. Will I ever <laughs> listen to them? Probably not. Let me just keep them. Right. I have, to, but, I have to admit, I have like, I have like 15 of them. Mm -hmm. And there's probably a lot more than that, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, I have a couple of live things. But yeah, I have more. I have more Osric Tentacles than I probably need. Jurassic Shift so great. was my first and my favorite. But Same. there's a lot of good stuff in there. I remember um, just looking at the like Spirals on Hyperspace was good. The Yum Yum Tree, even with the stupid title, that one was cool. Floor is too far. Or, yeah, the floor is too far away. Become the other. Curious Corn. There's some good there's stuff in there. Great. But to Stephen's point, do you need more? You get, you got the best. It's gonna probably sound similar. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And it was one of those things where like, ooh, Osric has a new album, I'll buy it. <laughs> they have a new album, oh, I'll buy that one too. 
And now I look back and we're on the show. I'm like, holy shit, I have 15 Osric albums. <laughs> I will say one of the most asked for bands by our viewers on this channel. Oh man. And that we never talk about. You never do a show on Osric Tentacles. Well, you just got five minutes of Osric Tentacles. <laughs> you, you thought and you thought Riverside would be tough to rank. Can you imagine doing Osric Tentacles? Jeez. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not listening to all of them in ranking. But don't put me on that show. <laughs> no. Good stuff, though. I mean, a really good band. Oh, yeah. Saw them live. Absolutely. Yeah. Really good. That's a great pick. All right, Rick, close us out. What do you got? Okay. So, the last one um, this is uh, during the COVID time in 2020. One of your rankings of this band got me to go deeper because. Um, I'm not really a greatest hit kind of guy, right? I usually get that, but I did get in the beginning, you know, when you were in Columbia House, they didn't, they had very limited selection. And I remember justifying CCR greatest hit by getting their catalog, or Leonard Skidder's greatest hit and getting their catalog. But there's the band I didn't get their catalog, and I'm kind of ashamed that I didn't because I like it so much. And I'm talking about, this is Argent anthology and so pete did a, a ranking and i'm like that sounds cool and i like a lot of these tunes and all splattered all through uh these albums so i started getting and you know all together now and i went in order of pete best so i got them first and as i go to the you know how to go on a scavenger hunt because some of these things are hard to find i was in first album and in deep which i love a lot encore and then how to get a few of these you know circus and uh counterpoint a few other albums that just not uh, you had to do your homework to find it but it was pete uh showed ranking on that that said why don't i got more than Argent? because i got all the zombies the career before him because i'm right into the british invasion so i collected that religiously why didn't i do anything past the uh anthology so your ranking got me inspired and so I wasn't off the bandwagon. I just wasn't that deep into it. I liked them, and it was a, kind of a shocking thing that I didn't put them up because even Uriah Heap did a cover of that album, Hold Your Head Up, yeah, on yeah. uh, Raising Silence. So I remember buying the Columbia House order just because they reminded me that this band came up with a hit. But I never went past their greatest hit till your ranking uh, of the album. Well, you know, you you bring up an interesting thing there because that, that could be like a whole other show. It's like, you know, yes. where you buy a greatest hits by a band because you want to investigate their music, or maybe you heard a bunch of the hits and you, you figure, all right, I'll get the, I'll get the hits collection. Maybe there's a few other things on there. I'm not really aware of and you get it and you really, really like it, but you don't go any further than that mm -hmm. ever. Right. Yeah. And that was one of them. And I had to justify that. Yeah. And I'm glad I did. Because there's some real cool gems in these albums. It's a shame nobody know past that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Hold your that, head That up. is a good Deep Cuts band. They really are. Thank you. That was you today, Pete, with America, right? Yeah. You only brought their greatest hits and... Yeah, yeah America, all I have. I, it's all I have. And I don't even know how many albums they have. I never even bothered looking into it. But I just know I, I love all the radio hits. And I, I bought that, you know, deluxe hits collection. I've been perfectly content with that for all these years and again i know myself right i'm not much of a folk guy but okay. their hit songs are i think are really great so they are. i'm like yeah am i gonna like the rest of this stuff yeah probably not so i just stuck with that but i too many times in my life i've bought greatest hit sets and then like you know two months later i'm like ah, well, who am i kidding man and i go out and buy the catalog right because that's the same thing <laughs> that surprisingly that band i didn't but before i let it go Guys, just raise your glass. Uh, tomorrow is Mike Portnoy's birthday. So we want to oh, wish him a happy cool. birthday. He's mm -hmm. been talked about on this channel many times. That's and right. for those who don't have a birthday tomorrow, happy 420. Oh, yes. That's, that's correct. Happy. Wow. Okay. Mike, happy birthday, my friend. Hope the happy tour is going bro. well. Uh, birthday, if you're Mike. watching, uh, I'm sorry I missed birthday, the New Jersey show, but uh, couldn't quite make it. Holiday weekend and that kind of stuff. So I'm going to sit in the prog seat, Portnoy. Yeah, yeah, man. Yes, yes. <laughs> Do I have to go out to St. Charles to tell you? Is that what, we, is that what I'm going to have? <laughs> Got to make that hour drive, man. There you go. Lewis. <laughs> Two hours, one hour each <laughs> way. Buddy. Oh, oh, me? I drive to Toronto four hours back there and back for content. Oh, well, you know, this is, um, you know, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> Luis. Hey, Luis, make Matt Lewis drive. <laughs> oh.
Now there's a thought. See what I mean? Uh -huh. Not. <laughs> <laughs> Get All a right. designated driver. That's always a way to do it. It's always a way to do it. I might, uh, anybody I might. got any a quick uh, honorable mention you want to rattle off? <laughs> George. I got one. I was yes. going to talk. I'll let Coach Chuck and say yes. I'm on board from time and a word all the way to union. After union, I was lukewarm on talk, and I've never heard anything up until last year when you talked me into checking out Key Studio. But other than that, I haven't heard anything from talk to the present. Key Studio is the last best thing they did. Pretty good, but again, I mean, we got a lot of music to listen to. Am I carving out time for the 11th best Yes album? No. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. A lot of, there's a lot of junk say, there. Yeah. I will say I do like the latter. No. Yeah, I like the latter as well. <laughs> no, no ladder for me. No invitation <laughs> for me. No heaven and earth for me. Oof. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. And I, I, I know, no. If you say yes, I say no. <laughs> Anthony's not going to be happy. <laughs> it's okay, man. We're watching you. Well, he's either going to be happy or he's going to be sitting there like this. <laughs> hey, cats, get off the table. Cats, yeah. <laughs> get off the table. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, we'll, get, we'll get one of these. <laughs> there you like, go. Oh, man. <laughs> Oh, man. Should, 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 should I turn the TV down? <laughs> we miss it. Like, yes, like, what, three do. episodes in a row, something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. On the other hand, you also get him making that crack about the hot pockets that was fucking classic. Oh, that was, that was <laughs> so, you know, you, you got to take everything, right? So it's, it's, it's a story arc. Yeah. And we don't know. He may have, he may have like, Got a big stain on the yellow sweatshirt and can't come on until it's clean. Who knows? <laughs> it's laundry day. I, I I don't want to imagine the words Anthony and stain. No, I don't want to think about the stain no. on the yellow sweatshirt. So well, no, it could be from the no. hot pockets. Yeah, he could have bit into a hot pocket, went right down on the yellow sweatshirt. <laughs> Uh, when, you say, say, when you said bit into a hot, that didn't help. <laughs> you know, you're That's taking this out of context. You're 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 taking it to another place. I know. And I knew you would because that's what you do, and that's why I love you. I know. I know. <laughs> Me love you a long time too. And not as much as your mom. You know that. I love your mom. Mom what says the, hi. What was the new word we learned, Lewis? What were you gonna do to us? Uh Malort. Malort. My Lord, my Lord, if you want to understand what's coming, uh -oh. and look, George knows what I'm talking about. He's just shaking his head disapprovingly because <laughs> he's a smart guy. And he's a Chicago guy, so he knows what the fuck. I'm just I saying, if you want to understand what's happening, look up Malort face on the internet. Malort is a drink that is made here in Chicago. And some of the taglines used to describe it is Malort, the night you fight your dad. <laughs> my lord how to unfriend someone face to face <laughs> and it goes on like this but if you guys I, remember if you remember way, bitter beer face my lord face is about 10 times worse yes oh. i i um we discovered it on tour we were we were actually touring chicago and we went to a place which just by coincidence is not far from where i now live it doesn't exist anymore it was a bar called Sturgis on Lincoln Ave. And um, you walk in that place. And, and the, that was when the, the bars were shifting to the smoking, no smoking thing, you know. And there was supposed to be no smoking. The owner of, of this bar had a, a, a talk box. And he would blow smoke rings out of it. That's how little he cared about his health and, and, and everything. <laughs> and he had to have a no smoking section. And the no smoking section were toy furniture nailed to the ceiling in a corner. That was the no smoking section. And that was a place. So we walked in after the show and, 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 and we were, I was getting a round of beers with Aaron and, um, and, and it said on the wall, when am a Lord? Ask me how. And Aaron asked Talkbox boy, uh, what's a Malort? And he goes, you went. <laughs> and, he just, and, he, and, he, and he just poured us the shots. And, 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 and I remember looking at the guy I said, but we're four. No problem. And he gave us another two. 
because you know it's like giving away urine why, why stop a two right <laughs> so he gave us a four we went back to the table and we took the shots and the way that i describe it is it's like carburetor kind of oil smell with with grapefruit with 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 really high um high octane alcohol chad hutchinson described it as it, there is whiskey and then there's ascii <laughs> my lord is ascii so he described it i am alerted at near fest i'm alerted mike mangini of all people who's a sweetheart of a man i was drunk but that's no defense because he's really a nice guy i just put my arm around him and gave him a shot and he goes oh thank you and he took it and then he looked at me without any malevolence but he just went why <laughs> oh, he said, why and, and that's the thing we we adopted this drink because it became a, a, a tool for discipline oh, whenever when we we had this rule in the band that if, if you fucked up you had to take a shot and every time you oh. fucked up on stage you you each had to take it out of your fuck ups to keep you honest mm -hmm. because it was so bad that nobody wanted to do it so you know we had this thing we just look at each other and just say that's some alert and uh -oh. at the end of the night, you had to pay up. You had to pay up the Malort God, right? Every time, and it helped. It really, it really made us be a much better live unit. So <laughs> it, it just became like a joke. And um, we all better so, be yeah. on our best behavior. No, no, exactly. you're getting it, no matter what. But, but um, <laughs> yes, but, you win. <laughs> so, <laughs> George doesn't look too happy there. <laughs> So this, this is why George has never told me where he lives, <laughs> even though we're, we're we could be fairly close. But you know, yeah. George, have you have you had him? Have you had him alert? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. It was punishment at some bar that I was in. It was like there you go. Yeah. Now the hipsters have, have taken over my lord. They think it's they even make my lord hot dogs. Really? Oh, oh. My lord cocktails. You know, you know that this this was bound to happen, right? But yeah. in the early days, it was just pure punishment and evil in liquid form. Ugh, you guys have a lot to look forward to. It at all. Uh, my honorable mention is uh, <laughs> on the bandwagon, off the bandwagon, and back on again is Camel. Oh. Kind of after Nude was kind of like, all right, kind of move on to other things because they have a lot of albums. And I'd always heard that a lot of the albums after this are real poppy and mainstreamy sounding. And, and while they kind of are, uh, many, many years later, I decided to finish the rest of the Camel catalog that I didn't have. And they're pleasant, right? And some of the latter, latter period ones are actually pretty damn good. It's kind of messing out. So, uh, so yeah, 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 not the wings and great jazz are good. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And nude is actually very good too. Oh, that absolutely it is. So yeah, that's, that's all I got. Me, uh, well, what's it? Oh, Todd uh, mm -hmm. uh. Not much to say, just a lot of stuff. And Todd's kind of, he does what he wants to do. So some stuff works and some doesn't. So sometimes I'm on, sometimes I'm off. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm most of the time off, sadly. Well, I'm always <laughs> off. Yeah. Oh, I like a lot of his stuff, but there's a lot of his stuff too that I don't care for much. He can be, he's genius on some, in some, aspects and then others it's kind of like what but yeah cool yep mm -hmm. on off and on um rush for me mm -hmm. uh, you know what's it yeah but i was like that you know what's it i went off of them for quite a while i saw them once didn't enjoy it but then um what's i got back into them after neil passed away you know and i do i do love clockwork orange I mean, Clockwork Art, forgive me. Forgive me, everyone. Forgive me. Clockwork Angels. <laughs> That's, That's good, too, actually. That <laughs> yeah, it's a good movie. A good movie. <laughs> it's a great movie. Yeah, yeah great so movie. that's it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, so that that's my that's my honorable mention. Mm -hmm. my, my honorable mention is a band that people probably presume that I really like, and I do, and that's Pain Dragon. Yeah, we're talking about that, yep. yep. Yeah, the limited amount that I know is excellent. This is pure. And it is fantastic. And I have the Masquerade Overture, which is ah, excellent. Yeah. And then I don't know why, but I ended up buying the best of. And, and that till, tells me that something went wrong somewhere. Yeah. Because <laughs> you don't start on the catalogue and then buy the best of, do you? So I like all of this. So I don't know why I ended up going that way. And that's where I've stopped. So that's my last one, thing, my honourable mention. Yeah, I would think that that would be a band where you pretty much would love the entire catalog. 
Yeah, I'm sure I would. <laughs> I just don't know. <laughs> Maybe someday, right? <laughs> yeah. It's another big catalog. Like Stephen, in so, six months, we're going to do a ranking show on uh, Pendrag. Get started. Okay, right? I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> and it looks like Max Scherzer's no hitter and shutout are over. Thanks, Chuck. Bringer <laughs> of good news there. Well, as long as they win, I don't care. So, you know. Yep, that's it. Winning 3 1. Yeah, the first game was pretty cool. So. Mm -hmm. All right, everybody, there you have it. So uh, on the bandwagon, off the bandwagon, uh, part two of two. Uh, you had part one last night of the Hudson Valley Squares, part two here today. So uh, any of you prog fans watching, if you have certain bands, prog bands, that uh, this whole phenomenon kind of happened with you, list it down in the comments below. And uh, while you're at it, visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Of course, we're here all together all oh, the time. Time. time that's right so uh, thanks for watching everybody tune in next week for more in the prog seat for rick labonte stephen reed chuck alvarez chad hutchinson lewis nasser george lemay and eric porter i am p pardo good night everybody see night, you everyone. tomorrow with more stuff take care good night yeah cool